afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Senior Wealth Manager here at Barometer Capital. And we thank you so much for joining another Barometer Readings web webcast. On today's webcast, as always, I'm joined by our Chief Investment Officer, David Burroughs, who will be providing us with a brief macro overview and uh, telling us the tales of the market and, and what he's seen over the last couple of days and perhaps what he sees the next few days. Uh, don't be shy. If you have any questions, please feel free to send those over via the Zoom Q&A or the chat. And with that, on this uh, brisk uh, January afternoon, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, Dave. Great to see you. Hey, Pamela. How are you? Great. Thank you. Hopefully you are somewhere warmer than where I am. It is cold here, and I'm sure it is where most people are today. <laughs> Well, well, hopefully uh, next week when I'm back in Toronto, I'm sure I'm sure that uh, I'll get a taste of uh, the cool weather that you guys are all enjoying. Thanks so much, Dave. Look forward to your uh, presentation yeah. this afternoon. Well, well, listen, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We're in the middle of January. Uh, we had a bang up uh, November, December. Uh, and as as often as the case, you move into January and people are, you know, jockeying positions trying to set out their course for the upcoming year. Uh, it's an election year. Uh, we've had questions over the last couple of weeks about you know, what we can expect in an election year. Uh, and as always, we're gonna take a look sort of from a high level to see you know, what if anything's changing. Uh, we're always interested in looking at the balance of evidence. We look at the market internals, what people are actually doing uh, versus kind of the discussion points, which is the news. Uh, news is always high level. What people actually do about the news is quite another thing. So um, just to start from the top, as, as we generally do, you know, from an asset class perspective, understanding sort of the big themes that are at play uh, and that the, the tailwinds or headwinds that we have from an equity perspective, you know, we believe that we are, you know, in an equity bull market. When we look at the, the Dow Jones back over time, the dark blue periods were structural bull markets. We exceeded the highs from the year 2000 and 2013, and we've seen Markets move higher in fits and starts since then. Certainly, you know, we've had our share of pullbacks, 15, 16, 2018, certainly 2020's uh, COVID pullback. Uh, and the uh, cyclical bear market that we saw from December of 2022. Um, when we look at the last two structural bull markets, the 80s and 90s, and of course, 2013 to present, you know, the one thing that always stands out to me is how, despite the fact you have pullbacks, this rising 200 week moving average tends to act as support, um, very different than what happens in a structural bear market. Uh, and, you know, you can see that that has been the case since 2013, very briefly dipping below during COVID uh, in the one month uh, we were selling off in the spring. So as we sit now, uh, here we are, we're just a snip below uh, all time highs. Uh, market is very close to exiting. You don't like to anticipate, but the fact is we want to be positioned for what comes next. When you exit a, a cyclical bear market, you tend to have two, three, four years of outsized returns, and they don't treat all stocks equally. There's groups that do better and groups that do worse, and uh, it generally pays to be in the strong groups as you exit a cyclical bear market. We look at the S&P. Uh, this uh, this last couple of weeks, we've seen some churning going on in and around the highs here. Uh, equity indicators, the breadth indicators that we follow turned up uh, in the first week of November. And we've seen improvement really around the world. We're going to talk about breadth trends today. But we've seen a series of higher lows since the October 2022 low. Uh, and now sitting here above not only the 200 day, the 150 day, the 50 day, the 21 day and the eight day moving average. So pretty hard to argue that the S&P isn't in an uptrend. Now we know we're gonna have volatility a few times a year generally, as many as three, 3% 3 pullbacks over the course of the year, sorry, seven, 3% pullbacks. We might have on average, you know, three, 5% pullbacks, we probably have a 10% pullback out there somewhere. You know, so we shouldn't be expecting this thing to go straight higher. We should expect a little churn from time to time. Typically, in the first quarter of an election year, you do get some churn as there is some uncertainty in the market. Um, last year, we saw markets dominated by the very largest of large cap stocks, especially in the first part of the year. 
first three months, really the only returns as the markets made a turn were from the big seven, big seven stocks. And they, of course, had very, very significant outperformance coming into December, not much other return in the market. So certainly for an income income investor, that made it tough because a uh, lot of these companies are not significant dividend payers. <clears throat> U.S. stocks have had unprecedented outsized returns versus the rest of the world. And we want to keep this in mind. We, we don't make decisions based on this, but we watch for signs of a change. Because when outsized outperformance comes to an end, like it did in the early 1970s and the Nifty 50, you know, global stocks can outperform for a long time. They did, of course, after, after 2000. And as a Canadian, you know, Canadian markets tend to be more closely correlated to global markets because our sector weights aren't too far off, with the biggest weights being in uh, financials, industrials, materials, and energy, a lot like sort of the global makeup of the indices are. Emerging markets versus U.S. stocks, you know, have underperformed for a long time, basically since 2011. We want to watch for any signs that there's change there when we recognize that when it changes, it can be important. So when we look at the TSX, you know, TSX over the last year, you know, was more choppy than the U.S. market. So we saw lows in, in October of 22, much like we did in the S&P, and then a series of failed rally attempts. Uh, as we continually bumped our head sort of at the top end of this range, the sell-off, the 10% sell-off that went on into the end of October eventually resolved. And I think that it is relevant and important that in the month of December, we did break above all of these previous highs. And actually, while the market has been a little bit sloppy at the beginning of the year, the TSX actually has held in pretty remarkably well. If we look at the long-term perspective, TSX looks a lot like a lot of other global markets. No real performance from 2008 through 2020. Uh, when COVID resolved, we had a nice rally. And then, of course, during the Fed's tightening cycle, we saw consolidation. These are monthly bars as the last two months. I think that that's pretty important, something that we want to watch. Now, that is against the backdrop where in Canada, we had really, really significant outflows from Canadian stocks. Now, there's lots of reasons why people are concerned about Canada. Political situation is difficult. Um, there's uh, certainly difficulty in, in real estate, which went through an unprecedented boom leading up to, you know, the, the beginning of rising rates. Uh, so things to watch, certainly. Um, but when we look at positioning versus what's happening, you know, there's a disconnect. Canadian stocks started to do better. Positioning, you know, has been very, very weak. We've seen maybe the start of some flows in, something to watch. From a valuation perspective, the TSX is not expensive. 13 times earnings. So if we go back to 2005, you know, we're in the lower third of valuations, where in the U.S. market, we're in the upper third of valuations. You know, the U.S. market's sitting at about... Uh, at about uh, 20 times uh, forecasted earnings and uh, in the top end of the bind. So the, the differential between Canada and U.S. is actually quite significant. When we look at the rest of the world, Japan just keeps on rallying. In the past week, there were three days where the market was up over 2%, uh, moving on to new highs. This is, again, moving out of a range that's been in since 1991, that's a very long structural bear market. And we know what comes after a structural bear market, a structural bull market. Investors globally are probably underweight Japanese stocks by a long shot. Uh, Warren Buffett was one of the first starting to move money into Jap Japanese market over the last year. Certainly we went there pretty early uh, as we started to exit. And we think this probably has a long way to go as we think India probably does as well. And when we put these things together, it makes us certainly a lot more bullish on global stocks and a lot more willing to allocate outside of North America and be less focused in, you know, the seven stocks that everybody owns. And it doesn't mean that there aren't some great companies in there. We, we own some, uh, but we're probably underweight uh, relative to the rest of the market. Global, val global valuations at 13 times versus MSCI US at 20 times. You know, that's as big a gap as we've seen in a long, long time. So... Again, we don't make decisions based on valuations until we see a change in market behavior. China, 
China continues to be the problem child in blue. This is relative strength versus the S&P 500 again today, a new relative strength, new low. And despite the fact that Chinese mark has been in difficulty for some time, really no sign of change. And I think structurally, this is really important. Foreign domestic investment in China quarterly, wow, that's a change. So as of the end of third quarter, you know, very significant outflows from China, and that was probably pretending some of the weakness. <clears throat> this, this could go on for a while. So this is an area that we're kind of avoiding. When we look at rates, now let's move on to the next asset class, bonds. We saw a very important structural shift in 2020. You know, beginning of you know very significant bear market and bonds. People aren't used to seeing a bear market and bonds, especially when rates have been falling since 1981. Um, but we're a long way away from resolving that bear market. And just because they've fallen in price doesn't mean that they have to rise in price. Um, now, <clears throat> if we do a comparison of dividend growth stocks versus the aggregate bond index, which is an aggregate of issuers and maturities in the US, you can see what happened when rates bottomed and started to rise. Look at the relative outperformance from 2020 spring until the beginning of the bear market in December, 2022. So that's investors voting with their wallets saying, I need something with a rising stream of income to offset rising inflation. Now, through the Fed's tightening cycle and through the bear market and stocks that we saw starting in the beginning of 2023, basically dividend growth and bonds did about the same. But as the market started to look beyond the Fed's tightening cycle, again, we started to make higher lows. So we think it's significant that dividend growth continues to outperform, even though rates moderated a little bit. We thought that maybe there was opportunity to do better in other assets than to focus on buying bonds. And this is the shorter term picture. This is the low in October when the market made its the stock market made its low. And, you know, we, again, are above all the moving averages in this relative relationship, dividend growth stocks versus versus uh, the bond index. So our interest continues to be focused on dividend growth. So since we saw the shift take place. Going back to the spring, uh, March of 2023, and as dividend growth took off, just to put a point on it, TSX over the period was up 11%. The U.S. equally weighted S&P was up 15%. So that's a stock component. In our income mandate, we could go anywhere for income producing assets. The aggregate bond index total return 2.7% from March to the end of December. The Canadian bond index up 2.3 and our income, tactical income portfolio up 11.9%. So an equity-like return, right, with a lot less volatility, this we think is most attractive for income investors finding things with an improving ability to pay. So certainly uh, uh, the beginning of last year dominated by large cap tech, but from March on we saw broadening and certainly dividend growth acting really, really well. So from a fixed income perspective, you know, the last time we saw rates shift in the late 1940s, early 1950s, you know, surprise, surprise, for the next 15 years, stocks performed very, very well. And especially dividend growth stocks, this led to the period known as the Nifty 50, where uh, inflation was an average about 1.6%, long-term government bonds average about 1.6% total return, and stocks gave about a 15% rate of return. Another way to look at this, um, people worry that if rates are higher, stocks and bonds can't do, stocks can't do well. In a falling interest rate environment, stocks gave about a 13% rate of return and bonds gave about a 14% rate of return. They got their coupon, plus they got some capital growth because rates were going down. So a 60-40 portfolio and falling interest rates did very, very well. So no wonder people like to have that kind of portfolio, because from 1981 to 2020, it really worked. But in a regime change, where you wind up in rising rates over time, stocks gave returns here of about two to one. We talk about this, this was closer to five to one. So very significant outperformance can come to equities. And so we watched to see if that's the case. And so far, that has been the case. 
from a commodities perspective, we saw low in 2020. You know, certainly um, after breaking out, we've consolidated over the last four or five months. I think this is not a big deal. We're trading above all of the moving averages. The moving averages are moving higher in general. We think that continues to be attractive, especially given the fact that investors are significantly, significantly underweight this asset class. So where we can make money is there's a mismatch between the way people are positioned and what's actually happening. And as people shift their views, it can lead to significant flows in, it's a significant outperformance. We'd like to be there as that takes place. Just quickly, because uh, we got uh, crypto, uh, uh, Bitcoin, uh, spot Bitcoin ETF approvals last week, we just wanna keep uh, Bitcoin on the screen. We've talked a little bit about this over the course of the last year. You know, Bitcoin's been going through its sort of cyclical bear market. It pulled back 77% into the end of 2022. It's been rallying since. We care because when it exits, it tends to have a pretty good run the same way stocks do. But if we compare the way that Bitcoin is reacting versus the equally weighted S&P, these have been important inflection points and we've been through this already. So, you know, even though uh, Bitcoin pulled back a little bit uh, last week, still on a relative basis versus equally weighted S&P, you know, looks pretty attractive. So we do have a little over a 10% weight between Bitcoin and Ether in our global macro portfolio. Okay, so that's what has been happening. Uh, we don't have to be everywhere. Our job is to sort of target what we think is market leadership. We're looking for the areas that are seeing net inflows of capital, where not only are fundamentals improving, but where money is recognized it and is getting put to work, where we're seeing expanding breadth. Uh, we're always watching for change. And one of the reasons we do these webcasts is to make sure that we get called sort of on the carpet. If there are changes, we got to be ready to change our positioning. Uh, and then the third thing is if there's no, no leadership, you know, we better have an ability to play defense because sometimes the best thing to do is to hold a significant cash weight. So this is a way that we go about being tactical with the portfolio is we know that 70% of return is driven by the top down, you know, constructive or, or, or weak asset classes, identifying the sectors or themes that are working within those asset classes and targeting the right neighborhoods. And then we target the right neighborhoods using individual securities that have to match our business tests and our technical tests. So where we can find uh, securities that meet both our business tests, good getting better, and are technically sound in parts of the market that we see are seeing net new inflows of capital. That's where our portfolio lives. And then of course we run stop losses in behind, which from time to time stop a set of positions we don't wanna get stopped out of, but that's the cost of making sure little mistakes don't turn into big ones. The top down work is driven by breadth. We're always looking for groups where over time a higher and higher percentage of stocks are participating, that's healthy. And when we see deterioration in breadth, even though our names may not be getting impacted, if the leaders carry on while the weaklings peel off, it tells us we should stop putting new money there. And it means that we should probably reduce our sector exposures. Now that's important given the market that we're in. So let's talk about that a little bit. And I see I didn't change the date this week. This, this actually is the chart from today, bullish percent in the US, globally, and in Canada has been improving and has been positive. It takes a 6% reversal in the percent of stocks in uptrends for us to reduce from green improving to deteriorating. Now, some of the uh, indicators under the surface have backed off a little bit, percent of stocks with the 50-day moving average, the percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum, percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows, and percent of stocks trading above their 150 day, specifically in the US. And I say that because I think it's interesting. Breadth around the world has been improving steadily over the last few months. Notably, China has had very narrow breadth and has been weakening. That's why we're avoiding it. But the US, Asia Pacific, most of Europe, uh, India, Southeast Asia, showing improvement across the board. I think this is interesting. If we look at NYSE bullish percent or the percent of stocks in, in on clearly defined point and figure price charts, so higher highs and higher lows, 
we measure here on the on the uh, y axis where as we're measuring the percent of stocks and uptrends since the end of October steadily the percent of stocks and uptrends has been rising we got to 64% as at the end of December now you can see at the top left here as of yesterday, 59.9% of stocks and uptrends it means percent of stocks and uptrends has backed off by just over 4%. It would take a 6% reversal in direction for us to move into a column of zeros. So we're pulling back a little bit. Some of the, some of the stocks have broken down on their point figure chart. At this point, not enough to change stance. If we compare that, for instance, uh, sorry, we look at the price chart in the S&P. S&P is trading basically from a whisper from the highs because, again, a lot of the big stocks continue to act really, really well. But we all want to know what's happening under the surface. If we look at the NASDAQ 100, 100 companies, hmm, this is interesting. November, December, the end of December, we got to a point where 86% of NASDAQ 100 stocks were in uptrends. Now, over the last two weeks, this has pulled back. It pulled back to 74%. This morning, pulled back a little bit more. And frankly, looks like at the close today, about 70% of stocks in uptrends. Or 16% of the 100 companies in the NASDAQ 100 have broken down on their point figure charts. Now, we've talked a little bit about tech and that the relative price behavior has been weakening a little bit relative to other things in the market. And I think that's frankly very healthy. Money's rotating to other places. Now, this is interesting. When we look at the percent of stocks in uptrends globally, taking all stocks globally, first of all, we turned up like we did in the US at the end of October through November and December. But look at this. We've recently taken out all of the previous highs of the last two years. And with the chart point at 48%, and as of last night at 48.3, we're above the most recent chart point, meaning breadth globally is expanding, even though we've, we've seen some contraction in the US. So now we talked earlier about the fact that global stocks, on a, from a valuation perspective, are a little cheaper. We've also talked about the sector makeups of global, global indices, higher fixed, higher uh, financials weight, higher industrials weight, higher materials weight, higher energy weight. It's just something to keep in mind. Internally, it looks like global stocks are strengthening more than we're seeing in North America. So from a sector exposure perspective, this week, bullish percent was down about 1%. The only group that turned down was restaurants. But we also, over the last few weeks, have seen things like aerospace, semiconductors, electric, electric utilities, waste management, apparel, that's textiles, um, gaming, and oil service, turned down on their bullish percent charts. Look at it another way. The sectors that have positive breadth and have strong relative strength versus the market are here in the top left quadrant metals, transports, business services, savings and loans, that's regional banks, biotech, well, you can read the list. This is the group I would want to be focusing on for new positions. At the bottom right, weak relative strength, small letters meaning declining breadth, oil service, electric utilities, apparel, would be avoiding these. Groups with neutral relative strength, and declining breadth, gaming, restaurants, semis, and aerospace. So we use these to help us focus our attention on where we would look to add new positions and where we want to be a little more cautious. Positive breadth with neutral rel relative strength, positive breadth with weak relative strength or earlier stage improvement. We watch these daily. Okay, well, let's look at the charts and see what shows up. XLK, large cap tech, Microsoft, Apple, Broadcom, NVIDIA, very significant parts of the CTF. Relative strength has been waning a little since uh, the beginning of November. The rest of the market actually performing just a little bit better. That's in composite. Now, all stocks aren't created equally. Semiconductors, semiconductors have now pulled back 10.6% uh, off the highs. This is the equally weighted semiconductor index, the XSD. 
and you can see relative strength has waned. The strongest part of tech, cybersecurity, continued on a relative strength basis to improve. In fact, as of uh, Friday of this past week, relative strength new highs. Our biggest holding here, or really our only holding here, is Palo Alto Networks made a new absolute high today, a new relative high today. So we want to focus on leaders. Probably wouldn't be adding new positions in this group right now because we're seeing some weakness in breadth and tech a little bit, uh, but certainly continuing to act really, really well. Uh, when we look at the semiconductors, we aren't adding new names, but we've had NVIDIA all year today, absolute new high, relative new high. Microsoft, absolute new high, relative, well, close to a relative new high. Uh, uh, and uh, Broadcom, you know, rising relative strength theme, rising relative strength over the last couple of weeks, trading within a whisper of new high. So the big positions that we have in tech, these are all in our top 10 positions uh, in the firm, acting well but we're a little cautious about adding new positions. Let's move on to financials. We talked a little bit last week about the fact that financials have come out of a long range that they've been in going back to 2007. We've been through a Fed tightening cycle and in the last couple of months, these have started to break out. We think this is really significant. Now, over the last year, we've talked about two groups. Specifically, we talked about uh, in, uh, property and casualty insurance. This is the universe of property and casualty insurance companies as a relative strength versus the market over the last two years, been pretty steady improvement. We've talked about Fairfax as a Canadian holding, sort of a, a, a baby Berkshire Hathaway. We also own Berkshire Hathaway. Thought maybe today we'd mention Progressive. This is also in our top 10 holdings. Uh, new relative strength high and made new absolute high on Friday. And I think the things really driving these, these names, first of all, pricing, for insurance has been very, very resilient. They've been putting through price increases with, without too much difficulty. The cost of repairing autos, which really went through the roof during the pandemic has backed off. And certainly they're getting better returns on their capital market's been better. And uh, the interest bearing vehicles as they've rolled over are rolling over it at higher rates. So <clears throat> three things that I think are, are quite positive. Uh, we've stayed away from the names that are more focused on uh, uh, transportation. You know, for instance, uh, the, the the insurance companies insuring ships in the Gulf. Uh, but but this group has acted really, really well and continues to perform well. <clears throat> the other group that we've talked about has been improving since June. It's capital markets, banks, and our biggest holding, of course, continues to be J.P. Morgan. I think it's important that they reported their earnings today. It opened down 4%, closed at the high for the day. Their net interest margins, the, the return that they're getting on deposits, they said is rising sharply, <laughs> excuse me, and their wealth management business growing really, really well. Uh, good growth in their assets. Those are probably the two most important drivers, although they did mention that they are seeing some somewhat higher charge offs coming from their um, uh, uh, credit card division. So something there to watch. Industrials. Industrials broke out at the end of the year. They pulled back over the first few days uh, of the year. Nothing really to worry about that. We're still trading above all the moving averages, the 50 day and the 21 day moving average. <clears throat> uh, electrical power equipment really has been leading now for almost two years. Our big weight here is Eaton Corp. They provide um, uh, systems for managing electricity in uh, industrial facilities. <clears throat> and of course, with automation uh, rolling out so significantly and the reshoring of manufacturing, having a clean supply of energy is really, really important. And the other area that's doing well is, is uh, general machinery, again, because of the reshoring of manufacturing. So something that we think is, is continuing on. These companies tend to be pretty flush. They don't tend to be doing a lot of borrowing. Uh, and so as a result, you know, are doing some significant capital investment. Materials. Now, materials <clears throat> includes metals and miners. It includes steel. It includes aggregates used in paving and and uh, and cement. Uh, broke out of a range recently. It pulled back over the last uh, last uh, four weeks, uh, which often happens when you break out of one of these what we call pennant formations. To retest that, <clears throat> metals and miners look more or less the same. Four weeks of a little bit of retrenchment, again, above all the moving averages. And most importantly, 
trading above this range that we were in going all the way back to 2014. Timber, same thing. Uh, the big holding that we have in, in timber is Stella Jones. They make telephone poles, utility poles, and it's just been on an absolute tear here for the last three years, you know, showing no signs of back, not relative strength, rising steadily and probably a beneficiary of both spending by utilities <clears throat> and the infrastructure spend going on in the U.S. Energy. Now, energy has seen some strong companies and some weaker companies. It's been challenging for people over the last three months. It has pulled back a little bit. We're sitting right in around the 50-day moving average, sorry, 50-week 50, 50 moving average. Um, we know that breadth for the energy sector recently reversed higher after pulling back through November and December. So this makes it <clears throat> eligible for new investment for us. We're not adding a lot new here and we're staying with the positions that we're focused on. We find that the largest companies generating the best cash flow are trading within a whisper of their highs. So companies like Imperial Oil and CNQ and Suncor <clears throat> with very long-term reserves, you know, are per performing the best. And that's where we've re remained. We think that long-term, when you get into a secular bull market, it can go on for a long time. But investors in general are very, very cautious. The combined net long positions are exceedingly low relative to the last few years. So again, there's a mismatch between perception and what's actually happening. We talked about pharmaceuticals last week. They continued to be strong this week. This is a group <clears throat> that we focused on over the last few months. Now we talked about Lilly. Lilly today opened at a new high. Uh, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, which is focused on cystic fibrosis, has ju had just a fabulous run, really great relative strength. It's a group where you have to be targeted. <coughs> Biotech showing some improvement, genomics are not, uh, but uh, with the largest of the large cap names are really carrying the day here. So nothing changing in those groups. Now let's look at the groups that have not been performing to see if there's any change. Now, for the folks that are looking for recession or significantly lower rates, <clears throat> you would expect that utilities would really be putting on a move. Not very economically sensitive, tend to have high yields with not very much dividend growth. But look here, relative strength has been weakening steadily. And despite the fact you've had some price improvement, relative to the rest of the market has been underperforming. We're basically at relative strength lows, no change here. <clears throat> In the consumer, we've talked about really focusing on sort of the low end consumer, Kushtard, which is gas stations, uh, uh, convenience stores, uh, Dollarama, we've talked about over the last few months being important and Amazon being important and the to a low cost retailer uh, and Costco. Nice relative strength here. So that's that's more defensive, but that's the best part of defensive equities. On the other hand, telecom, you know, continues to see weak relative strength. So utilities and telecom, nothing changing. Bonds relative to stocks, nothing changing. That's why we've been steadily, you know, spending our cash as opposed to adding bond positions. Consumer staples, defensive, not making any progress from a relative strength perspective. Now, not to say there aren't one-off companies. Costco actually fits into consumer staples. We look at it more as a retailer uh, and it's certainly performing well. And then clean energy, which was weak all last year. Now this represents companies that don't generate a lot of cash, but that need financing to build out capacity. So if you're building a solar farm, <clears throat> or you're building uh, building a wind, a wind farm, a lot of capital spent without tons of revenue coming back right away, their long-term projects. And of course, higher rates have made it a real challenge to get financing in this group. So <clears throat> companies that consume cash continue to be a problematic uh, part of the market. Defensive sectors continue to be a problematic part of the market. More economically sensitive groups frankly, continue to be amongst the best. So recession, no recession. I have to vote right now with the fact that if we have some kind of pullback in the economy, it's likely to be a soft landing unless something changes from a, from a 
market uh, participation perspective. So what does that mean? So financials continue to be <clears throat> really our largest weight and they have been since October, November. Technology, market cap mar from the S&P perspective, 28% of the index, 17% in our portfolio. We have been moving that lower, not because the positions we have aren't doing well, but breadth is really not supporting adding a lot more. And frankly, valuations are expensive. Industrials continue to be an overweight, although slightly less overweight. Uh, materials, a significant overweight, nothing changing there. Corporate bonds, about 7.5%, largely in our balanced mandates where we have to own fixed income. Energy is an overweight, but no real change, about 8%. Consumer staples, underweight. Healthcare, underweight. Discretionary, underweight. Communication services, underweight. Real estate and utilities, underweight. So it's a place where you have to focus. This market is not one where we own every group. I think it is a market where over the course of the year, there's gonna be significant opportunity to outperform because some big parts of the market just not acting that well. If we see global equity participation continue to expand, we will continue to expand our global holdings. And that's one of the key reasons why we took our Canadian, equi sorry, our equity mutual fund and converted it to a global equity fund, XUS, as of the end of December, and pretty excited about that for the upcoming year. So things we're watching, money market continues to be significant. And while all of this is not in the hand of individuals, some of its individuals and some of its companies, there's a lot of money that can be put to work. It's one of the reasons why with the tightening cycle that's taken place, there hasn't been more of a crunch because there's cash out there. From an from a election year perspective, when a midterm year was negative, that would have been 2022, pre-election year tends to be positive, was positive every time since 1916, of course, last year was, and an election year tends to be positive, although the first couple of the months of the year are probably where you see a little mushiness. This is the first quarter of the year on average, was only up about 0.2. But we have to tease things apart. In a year where it was an open presidential election, well, about break even. In a year where it's a presidential re-election year for a second term, much better returns. Of course, that's what we're facing right now. So our breadth models in general are positive. Global breadth mods, models, positive. Economically sensitive groups continue to act well. Seasonally, we know that <clears throat> first couple of months can be choppy, but we want to be there for when we exit from this 24-month uh, cyclical bear market. We know there's lots of flows that tend to happen at the beginning of the year, January through May, and we know that money is getting put to work. And we know that estimates, maybe they've come down a little bit, but we're gonna learn a lot more through the earnings period over the next three weeks. Credit spreads have been narrowing and volatility is muted. All things that we would watch for signs of change. So while there's always things to worry about, there's always geopolitical risk and there's lots of them that are out there. Investor behavior in the market supports constructive markets. So. We'll see when we eventually exit above this range, we're very, very close. And there is some pretty clear leadership in the market. If there's change, we're happy to make changes. We're happy to raise cash. But the fact is we have to make sure that we stay in tune with markets. And right now, nothing appears to be changing. So with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Hey, Dave, thanks so much for the update. As always, we don't have any open questions right now that I'm seeing. So I think you've covered everything and I will leave you with the final word as always. Appreciate it. Well, we know there's all kinds of folks who had uh, time away over the holidays. We know that um, sometimes it takes people a bit to get going at the beginning of the year. Uh, so it's been kind of quiet um, for clients. We're trying to organize as many, you know, client conversations and reviews as possible. Uh, if we haven't spoken to you yet, please reach out because we want to make sure that we have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Thankfully, there's 
there's not so many families that we can't have one-on-ones with everybody. Uh, and, uh, and we look forward to, to another year. Um, you know, March to December was very strong start. We were really well positioned. And I think that we're well positioned coming into this year. If you got any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you're too shy to ask them on the webcast, you know, send us a message, send us an email, make a phone call. Uh, happy to jump on the phone. So with that, Pamela, thanks very much for, for uh, moderating today. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks, Dave. Bye, folks.